What's happening? This is Everdon, and welcome to another episode of Beats for Breakfast. Today, I am joined by the fellow chill cast homie, the one and only your player two. What's going on, man? Uh, it's, just, it's just such a high pressure intro. Like it, it, it's good <laughs> to be here, man. I'm excited, and, and I feel back. It's like I have not, as of yet, watched an entirety of an episode yet. Like I, it's gonna, I listened to most of the one with Nick and a little bit of the one with Rob. Uh, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm super pumped to be here. Like I feel like we don't get a lot of one on one, you know, conversation like this. We don't you know, in a collaborative fashion. We don't. We, well, so, we've collaborated before, but we never did it like, you know, in, in like a, a live chat. So not really live, but you know. Well, I mean. you know, just us talking about, you know, video games and stuff. We, you know, have phone conversations, but right. over actual content. So it's going to be fun. But I know who you are. I'm sure a few people know who you are who's watching this video. But for the people who don't know who you are, who is your player to? Yes, yeah, so uh, I am your player too, or Joshua, whichever you prefer. Uh, basically, my channel is, uh, I, I start off as a completely different channel. I just knew that I wanted to do something that was sort of creative. And over time, I kind of realized that I really needed to sort of narrow my focus. And I tried to think about the things that I was most likely to stick with long term. And when I thought about the things that I've always stuck with, it had always been gaming. I've not stopped playing video games since I was probably three, four years old. I, I would say it's the earliest that I can remember. Um, and But more than that, you know, there are a lot of gaming channels out there. And I did want to find a way to sort of distinguish myself. And the other piece of that was, you know, for me, I definitely had an eye towards, uh, I guess, an entrepreneurship angle for it, which, you know, for me, the pursuit there is like, I want to be able to make creative stuff all the time. Like, I love doing it. It's just something I can get completely lost in. I adore the process. So when I really started thinking about it, I wanted to make sure that not only was I making gaming content just because, you know, I enjoy it and it's fun to make, um, but also I wanted to see if I could provide something of real value, something that when I look back at the things that I made over the course of, you know, 5, 10, 20 years or, you know, however long I'm able to do this, which I hope to do forever, uh, that it would be something that I would be happy with and proud of. And one of the things that's always been very fulfilling to me is when I can help somebody else work through an issue that they're having. Anytime I can do something that's, you know, sort of helpful or help somebody solve a problem or, or encourage somebody, that's something I can definitely get behind. So I kind of put the two together and became your player too. Wow. That's, that's pretty, that's a pretty amazing back. See, this is why he, he's the home. I'm pointing the wrong way. I'm pointing this <laughs> way and everything on camera. Wait, it's really actually pointing this way. This is, <laughs> This is annoying. This is annoying because Josh is to my actual left. So I'm pointing to my left, but he's actually this way. So if you guys saw me do this earlier or this earlier, I meant to do this. But anyway, um, that's really awesome that the, you, from, as long as we've been friends, we never heard a full backstory behind your name. So that's actually really cool. But um, I wanted to ask because you actually did something late last year. Kind of late last year, like towards the end of the summer, towards going yeah. in, towards the end of the summer, going in towards the end of the fall, you did something that I never saw anyone really do. And instead of making creative content, you just push all that away. Yep. And you said that you was going to do a 90 day, almost 90 day live stream challenge. It was weekdays for 90 right. day in a 90 day period, excluding weekends, but mm -hmm. Monday through Friday, a morning show. Yeah. What were your takeaways with that, man? So starting at the beginning, the reason I decided to try it were the, the reasons were a few fold. Uh, one is I want to try to challenge myself. That was a very challenging thing. Now I had live streamed before. And the weird thing is, is, uh, very early on, I, I would say like a few years ago, I was staunchly against live streaming in any capacity. I looked at it and I was like, why would I watch somebody play games when I can just play games? I was very dismissive of it. And it wasn't until I really became a more active member of the gaming community, I think, where I really started to see the value in live streaming, period, right? And it's, I think it's an incredibly valuable format, not just for gamers, although I think, you know, obviously that medium lends itself very well to the live stream format. But I think it's really useful for any content creator who's looking to build an audience or grow a following or really connect with people on a deeper level. And that's something I've always sort of aspired to do. So I kind of had this idea that I would just try 90 days of live streaming so I could understand at both macro and micro what was going to happen. And macro, I wanted to know, will this tank my channel? If I just do 90 days of live stream and I'm not uploading something that's pre-produced, um, is you know YouTube going to rank this in such a way or am I going to hurt my channel's growth in a significant way by, you know, uh, going with this format, right? Because there's it, it's different live streaming than when if you pre-produce something, upload, and then you carefully do all the tags and titles and everything. And I, I would... I, I don't want to say I was flying by the seat of my pants for 90 days, but there were some days where it kind of felt like that. But, you know, so at, at macro, I wanted to understand, is this going to hurt my channel or is it going to be something cool? Maybe provide a bump to my channel. 
And then at the micro level, uh, I really wanted to challenge myself because historically I had been uh, a, a huge hermit, right? Like I've never really been shy in person. Like, you know, if, if I just walk into a room full of strangers, really no problem. Just, you know, chatting people up and getting to know people. But online, I was always very scared to talk to people or engage with people because I assumed everyone on the internet would think I was an idiot. So for a long time, I wrote off Twitter. The only social media I really did was Facebook, and I didn't even really like it that much because Facebook can get fairly, I mean, I guess any community can technically get kind of toxic if, you, if you're looking at the wrong stuff. But um, I Facebook anymore. I, it's funny you mentioned that. I <laughs> yeah. just deactivated my account today. Yeah, like, and, and this thing, I have not been active on Facebook since the end of 2017, past two years and change now, like, the only time I go there is when my mom calls me and yells me, like, why didn't you look at that nice thing I tagged you in on Facebook? I'm like, I'm sorry, and then I jump <laughs> on there, too. Uh, but, like, but <laughs> and that's the thing, like, I had, I had done live streams on the channel before, mostly gaming streams, um, you know, for the most part, but I really liked the conversational sort of aspect to it. And I was like, you know, let's say theoretically that I did want to do a live format show. And I'm not like the first person to do like, um, like helpful content in that arena. Like, you know, some of the people I would watch would have been like Sean Cannell, uh, from think media, uh, Nick Nimmin, who you turned me on to actually. And I was like, you know, if I'm somebody who wants to help other creators, you know, can I on a regular basis, get up and do this? Um, so I was, I, I have a huge, just horrible habit of biting off more than I can chew. Like one time I decided I was going to do a hundred vlogs for a hundred days. And that was a nightmarish thing. So I was up to like three in the morning, every night editing. And I was a walking zombie for a period of, of months. It was awful. Uh, wait, yeah. wait, 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 what, what caused that idea? What brought that idea? Uh, at the time I had been watching uh, a fair amount of, uh, Casey Neistat and I thought it was really cool. And I, I, you know, I'd seen people do vlogs before, but not nearly with the sort of dynamic quality that he did it. Right. And he had a style all of his own. Like I loved his very analog approach to things where he would just like draw stuff out in his horrible handwriting and then just like hold it up to the camera. But it was a style that was all his own. Um, and I was like, well, you know, at the very least I'll have fun, right? I'll learn more about shooting. I'll get you know better as somebody who, you know, shoots beer roll and stuff like that. If I just try vlogging. So I decided to give that a shot. Um, and the live streaming thing w was very similar to that in a lot of ways. Like the, the thing that really w was a parallel is I really did bite off more than I could chew because it's really hard. And I actually have a video coming out, uh, I think here in a couple weeks about how hard it is to live stream period. And then sort of putting myself through a gauntlet where every day at 8 AM, like an hour before I have to clock in for work that I was you know going live and talking to people, uh, it, it's exhausting. Like, it's so hard because, I mean, live streaming has so many unique challenges compared to pre-produced, right? You're on the spot. You never know who's going to bomb in on your chat. You never know if someone's going to throw you a curveball that you don't know how to answer. Um, which I, I was never really worried about that last part. But, yeah, I mean, it was it was like an endurance trial. But I'm, I'm glad that I did and I learned some things. And now uh, I, I think the conclusion I came to is am I technically capable of carrying a daily morning live show? Yes, I could. But at this point, it would be too much for me to maintain with pre-produced content that I think probably brings more value because I make I can make more in-depth technical concepts a little bit clearer if I if I touch on something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but when and if I go full time someday with the channel, I will bring that daily live show back absolutely as a way to to, to start it because it, it was amazing. I got to I got to meet some new people. Uh, I had people who would start messaging me like an hour before I was even up. Like, are you are you going live this morning? Uh, and there were people who were really invested in it, and I, and I enjoyed it. I, you know, just learned a lot of cool things about the community. You know, I got to challenge myself a little bit. It was, it was a fun time. I don't regret it, but it, it is tiring. I will say that. Um, yeah, and I would say it's. Well, let me ask. Let me ask this because I know um, you mentioned this earlier. You wanted <laughs> to see on a macro level would this tank your channel? Right. Now, for the people who are watching, did it, did this have a negative effect on your channel, or did this have a positive effect on your channel? It, it, it's weird. I would almost say a little bit of both. It, it's almost like it was positive, just not in the way that I expected. It was. I, I think that in terms of raw metrics, I was not seeing a significant dip or increase from my normal standard amount of views, which, again, like my view count is lower than the average. And the reason for that, kind of going back to the beginning of this, is my channel i've been on youtube for a decade but i haven't been a youtuber except for the past two or three years in the early days of youtube i was just sort of periodically screwing around making videos i thought were you know were fun and i didn't really have a strategy in mind i didn't have a clear focus um so i would pick up subscribers from videos 
or I would pick up subscribers who would like come in and be like, ooh, this guy likes Spider-Man. I'm going to subscribe because he made this cool Spider-Man video. And then I would not make a Spider-Man video for months or years ever again. And that's when I started to kind of realize, like, you have to have some consistency because if not, then you're, you're kind of not delivering on the promise you're making when you ask people to subscribe to your channel. And that was something that I learned as I, you know, moved more towards being a YouTuber than just, you know, a guy randomly throwing stuff at the wall to see what would stick on YouTube. Okay, okay. So my question to you is... Now, since you've been on YouTube for over a decade, but you you just becoming a YouTuber now mm -hmm. within the past like, two or three years? Yeah, yeah. I would I would say that it was around uh, the beginning of 2018. Yeah, Pro probably probably mid 2017. And yeah, because mid 2017, I, it was it was still uh, branded Eight. under a different name. And then I moved to your player Two uh, near the end of that year. And that's when I, I really started to ramp up was, you know, the past. I guess it would be two years and change now because we're right at the beginning of 2020. Yeah, because actually I remember I remember the, the old name too, actually. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. That's cool. But um, what are your thoughts on YouTube AdSense? And I'm asking that because a lot of YouTubers, you know, they no, not YouTube, a lot of viewers, they watch YouTubers and, you know, they know we get paid with the ads and everything. Sure. What are from a business perspective, not just from like a personal perspective, but really from a business perspective, what are your thoughts on YouTube AdSense or a YouTuber relying on YouTube AdSense? What are your thoughts on that? Um. So when you ask me for my thoughts from a business perspective, do you, do you mean like, do I think it's a solid platform? Like to speak to it's, it's like pros and cons, like merits and foibles yep. and that kind of thing. So I think AdSense is wonderful. Um, I, but I also think that, well, I'll, I'll get to that part in a second. At just at face value, AdSense is a very cool system, right? I mean, you, you basically have companies that go out to bid on ads that are, you know, uh, based around relevant topics that are going to interest, you know, potential buyers for them or customers that they want, you know, they, they kind of want to draw in by getting their content in front of the people who are going to appreciate it and be likely to click through and buy. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, I got to say, it's a pretty cool thing, right? I mean, if you're, if you're somebody who's taking YouTube seriously and you're putting in the work and you start getting AdSense checks, like that's a really cool feeling. And for a lot of people, that is probably their first introduction to making money online. If, if not, you know, maybe like an affiliate program or something in, in the vein of Amazon. And, you know, I think that, uh, AdSense is, is great. And I, you know, I appreciate the money that I earn from it, but at the same time, uh, going to that personal level, I would say that, uh, to rely on it a hundred percent would not be a good idea. And the reason I say that is because we've seen so many changes with the YouTube platform, even over the past year, we saw uh, issues where, you know, obviously everyone was real hot at the end of the year last year about Cabo. Oh, well. you know, people were flipping out. They were like, I'm shutting down my channel. I'm going somewhere else. And the weird thing is a lot of people didn't even really need to do that. It created this sort of huge scare in the community where a lot of people were like, well, if I have a gaming channel now, that's going to be targeted to kids. And then I'm going to get my you know, channel shut down or I'm going to get sued by the FTC. Um, and none of that was really uh, warranted unless you explicitly had a channel that was targeting children, right? Like you only ran like puppet shows and stuff like that. And you were clearly speaking to like a sub 13 year old audience. Yeah, you would have been in trouble. Um, and a lot of, you know, and really what I'm saying here is the the problem with YouTube AdSense, I, I guess I would say, or, or putting 100% of your faith into it as a path to revenue is you don't have control over that platform, right? You know, Google maintains control over that platform and a lot of people want to get mm -hmm. upset about it and say, you know, uh, it shouldn't be this way, it should be this way. And to them, I would say like, that's the price of admission, right? If you want to play in the in, in the YouTube sandbox, then the cost of that is that you give up a lot of control, you play by their rules, you collect your check, or you don't if you're not willing to abide by those rules. Um, and that's the thing. Lots of people are, you know, were abiding by the rules, but you still, you never know with a platform you don't have control over, it could change on a dime, right? This COPPA thing was not a new development, but it was a new development for a lot of YouTubers out there who weren't familiar with it. And it, it certainly reached critical mass after they, they caught that, that fine from the FTC to the tune of, I think, like $210 million or something like that. Um, and that's when it became a real issue for us as a community. So uh, AdSense, great. But I would not put all my eggs in one basket. You know, if you're somebody who's on the platform and you're looking to do this as a side hustle, if you're looking to grow it into a full time gig someday, then you have to think long term. YouTube's a marathon. It's not a sprint. A lot of people think like, oh, I want to make money on YouTube. Like, like there are way go shovel some snow, bro. You will make money way faster than you just trying will. to make it on YouTube. You uh, definitely will. Yeah, so it, it's great, but with the caveat that, you know, there are lots of other, and I would say even more effective ways to make, because for a long time, my, you know, affiliate revenue for me, like Amazon affiliate, I was making more on that for sure than I was through AdSense revenue. AdSense revenue, I was making like 
10, 15 cents a day. And then it's like, you know, you don't get paid out till you make a hundred bucks. So it might be months before you get a paycheck from, from YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, well, technically from Google, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a great platform, but you know, ultimately be smart about it. And, you know, I really, I, I truly empathize with any of those YouTubers who were kid targeted and they had no other means of revenue. Like maybe they didn't have, you know, their own merch store. They didn't have any affiliate links, you know, sort of littered throughout their video and other online presences. And for a lot of them, they probably took a significant revenue hit. I mean, there's just no way around it. Like if you demonetize kids videos and all your content is kids videos, like you just lost everything. If that was the only thing you were relying on for an income and that sucks. Yeah, the only thing about YouTube AdSense that I would say, kind of what you're saying, you should not rely on it. It's it's a form of passive income, basically. And even though passive income is really good, relying on it is is almost business suicide because at the end of the day, you're going to start stressing out if you have a slow month and you're right. going to start. The best way I could put this, excuse me. The best way I could put this is it's almost like you let your hobby become your profession. And in many cases, that could be good. But many people don't discuss on many cases how that could be a very bad thing, because when your hobby becomes your profession at that point, then the love for what you do starts to get jaded and it starts to fade away because oh, yeah. now you're doing things. You're doing what you love for profit and you're focusing on profit more than what is fulfilling your fulfillment, you know, because right. profit, hey, you need to eat. So, and you're good at what you do. So it's like, I gotta make this the best I can so I can eat or my family can eat. Right. But that's not a good position you would ever wanna put yourself in. So to what you're saying, Josh, I agree. Like YouTube AdSense is really cool, but should be treated as like the sec as secondary. Oh yeah, it, it, it's a privilege, not a right. And right, I, and I think you're right. Like, and, and that's the thing. Like, I've heard a lot of people say, like, be careful about monetizing your hobby because typically, like, a hobby is that thing you use to escape from the drudgery or the other parts of your life. Like, it, it's a way to chill out from the things that sort of you know hold you accountable or things you have to be responsible for. Because a lot of us have adult responsibilities and things we have to think about, like mm -hmm. like taxes and family and social lives, all these other things. And usually, hobby is like an escape for that. But the weird thing is, to your point. If you're not careful and you, you know, you sort of put all, I guess like, I hate to keep saying like all of your eggs in one basket, but it's kind of true. If you put all of your, 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 you know, ability to generate revenue behind your hobby and you've monetized it and you have no other options, like let's say you quit your day job, you decide you're going to be full-time YouTuber, you do it for two years, you, you know, you have no other marketable skills and you, you kind of haven't been in the marketplace and then you get hit with something like COPPA where like 80 or 90% of your revenue evaporates overnight, but that's a rough spot to be in. Um, you know, it, it, at that point, your hobby almost becomes, it's almost like it's taking you hostage because you have to keep doing it at that point. It's not this, this kind of joyful choice you make anymore to kind of chill out on a weekend. It's this thing that you have to keep doing or you don't get paid. And that's definitely something to be cognizant of. I'm not saying that happens to everybody, but it's definitely something to think about. It's scary because it's like YouTube is not like how it used to be. So it's like you're not gonna always you may not get that viral explosive growth so you can just live off the success of your vir viralicity and that's really hard for people at times because people don't know how to make original content to make people people keep coming back and right. that's something that i feel i want to learn how to do more with beats for breakfast so i was actually talking with chips earlier and he was asking me about you know how the numbers doing for beast for breakfast and i just said as of right now that's not my focus right my focus is not to focus on how well this is doing in numbers right but for me to put it out there then watch it again by myself and see okay i could work on this i could work on that 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 and right. that's the point that i'm at right now and i think that makes sense on a couple of different levels like First off, and I've said this before, numbers can be incredibly misleading, right? I've seen YouTubers who only have like 500 subscribers and they have comment sections that are overflowing with super passionate, engaged viewers, right? See? I've seen people with just multiple tens of thousands uh, of subscribers and their comment section is a ghost town. They're not getting engagement. You know, they're not getting the watch time, which is something that fuels AdSense revenue, you know, to, to begin with, really. Um, so, you know, I, I don't put a lot of stock in that. Like, even now, like, I've had people tell me, like, ooh, you're almost 10,000 subscribers. I'm like, yeah, but that's the thing. It's more like maybe five or six. And I'm, and I'm not trying to, you know, say, like, that that's not an accomplishment. It is, and I'm really happy with where I'm at. But I also know that it's really misleading, right? And I think that 
what happens to a lot of YouTubers uh, is that that can sort of lead to the, the, this sort of ego problem, right? Some people, like, once they start getting a little bit of traction, they get a little bit of fame, they're like, um, you know, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm too important to talk to, to people. Or, or they don't even respond to their own comments, which I think is just an abysmal attitude. Like, I'm so incredibly grateful anytime I get a comment on a video and I do my best to respond to every single one of them, uh, which at scale may not be possible one day, but man, until it's running me ragged, I'm going to keep trying to do it. Cause like people could spend their time anywhere and they took the, the most precious resource they have and they spend it watching 10 minutes of something I said about the, you know, a dual shock four controller. And, and the, that's, that's awesome. And the thing is, it's like, they can't even get that time back. And it's right. like, they donate that to you. So whether the comment is negative or positive, you have the choice to say, I'm going to reply with kindness. Right. I'm going to block you. I'm going to report you as spam. Yeah. And I said, literally, that's those are your options. But um, you talked a lot about, you know, the gaming niche. Have there been other niches that you've been interested in or other people that you would like to help in these niches? It's weird because I feel like now one of my biggest struggles, and it's something that I'm trying to rein in this year um, in terms of my content strategy is, uh, and I've heard people say this, and I feel like it's both a positive and a negative. People have said to me, you know, and I've even noticed just making it, a lot of the videos I put out, they would be just as applicable to somebody who's running a botany channel as somebody who's running a gaming channel, right? If I tell you, like, you know, make sure your your, your edits are on point or make sure your lighting's correct or, or make sure you're leaving pauses in your delivery – Anybody making a video could benefit from those sort of tips. So one of the, so one of the things I've been trying to do is to focus more narrowly and and find that sort of Venn diagram intersection between you know gamer and YouTuber to find the stuff that really matters to them. For instance, if I just say like, yeah, and, and it's and it's weird. I, I thought about it. I literally like drew this giant post that in, in in my you know uh, near my desk area here, and I was like trying to think of ideas. I was like, man, this is really hard. And then it kind of clicked. I was like, of course it's hard. If it was if it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be worth doing. Um, so now I'm doing videos where it's less like, here's five great cameras. Instead, I'm like, you know, here are five great cameras that work well with OBS, you know, something where it, it, it hits a particular focus. Um, so that's been kind of, now it's helping as far as helping other people in other niches. Like, would I ever pursue, like, just be like, you know what? I'm going to help the magic, the gathering channels, or I'm going to help, you know, educators who want to make videos and stuff like that. I would probably be open to it, but my heart would never be in it the same way as it is for gaming. Um, and maybe this is going to sound bad. I'm not sure if it will. You know, we can always edit this out. It's Go not ahead. live. You just edit it out half a time. Uh, but I'll just say, like, I think that there stereotypically there have. Been, I think gaming has been a haven for a lot of introverted people who sometimes are are afraid to be themselves and Ooh. to connect with people. What? No, I I like that point. That's actually a thought provoking point. I want to hear more. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's the thing. I, I mean, I'm half joking when I say you can edit it out, but what I mean is I don't want someone to be like, "Hey, you just said gamers are just like basement dwelling nerds." That's not as a basement dwelling nerd myself. Not what I mean. What I'm saying is, <laughs> I, I know how much it sucks to be stuck in your own head, and I know how much it sucks to feel like you can't connect with somebody. And I think the, really, if I'm being honest, the most fulfilling part of, of everything that I make is, is not really the comments where someone's like, hey, thanks for telling me what graphics card I needed, or hey, thanks for telling me you know, what I need to do this edit better. What really gets me, the thing that really hits me just right in the feels is when someone says, hey, I started a channel because of something you said, or I decided to pick back up on my channel because of you know some point you made in the video. Because I know that like the internet historically can be a very isolated, despite the connectivity, can be a very toxic, very isolating place where it, like I was for a long time, it, it can be very scary to reach out and connect with people, which is something you kind of need to be successful, I think, in this arena. Um, so the short answer, I guess, is yes, I would be willing to help people in other niches, but I feel a particular kinship with the gaming community because it's something that I've done forever. Gaming's been there for me when I've gone through some really rough times. I know that it's been there for a lot of people out there right now the same way. Um, and for people who are trying to just kind of get over that hump or find that, that one just spark of confidence that they need to get going... That's what I love to do. So I, I think that, yes, I'd help people, but I'm always, I'm probably always going to just, you know, stay here in the gaming area because I just, I love it. I love the people. They're great. Respect on that. Uh, for me, as you saw, I didn't leave gamers. I just found, used to turn this platform to just invite more people. Right. And I want to invite more musicians. I want to invite more rising entrepreneurs outside of just gamers. You know, I feel like just talk about video games by itself for me doesn't really circumference my full personality. Sure. But before we get any further in this interview, we're going to take off quick first, a quick first, our quick <laughs> first. That makes so much sense. 
our quick first commercial break. We'll be back shortly. Stay tuned. whole lot of fun you get to play some of your favorite games you get to hang out with a bunch of like-minded people who also appreciate the same kind of games that you do in a lot of cases and if you're good enough at it you can also make money doing it whether that's through things like in-stream donations or ad revenue or merchandise sales or whatever there's just a lot of cool things about streaming and it's absolutely alluring to a lot of people but despite the fact that streaming is really quite awesome it's also really really hard and the reason I wanted to make this video is because I was talking to a friend the other day who isn't quite as familiar with YouTube and gaming and that whole culture. Uh, and they were just like, oh, well, that must be super easy just to, you know, just play games whenever you want and then just get money for it on YouTube or whatever. And while I can kind of understand where they're coming from, I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions, not just with people who aren't really familiar with like YouTube and streaming in general, but also from people who might be thinking about diving into streaming about how easy it is to just do it all the time on a regular basis and really not seeing some of the difficulties that you will absolutely encounter if you decide to start streaming stuff on YouTube. So today I just wanted to go over what I felt were some of the most notable hurdles that you will likely encounter if you decide to start streaming gameplay online. And the first one that I can think of is that it is absolutely mentally taxing to stream games on a regular basis. Because it's never just the game, right? You also have a ton of other things that you have to keep track of in the moment. Things like chat, the people who are dropping in, promoting the, the fact that you're streaming at all on social media. You have technical details to worry about. So sitting down for a few hours to play Pokemon by yourself is way different than saying, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to stream my Pokemon experience for potentially hundreds of people online and make sure that all of that stuff goes off without a hitch, both from a technical perspective and from a gameplay perspective. And depending on how aggressive your streaming schedule is, that can absolutely take a toll on you. I wasn't even playing video games in the morning. I was just talking on a stream for about 90 days there. Every weekday I was trying to get up and just talk on stream. And that in itself was getting a little bit tiring, a little bit taxing. So when you throw in all the additional technical details that come along with showcasing the gameplay that you're doing, keeping track of things like OBS and the scenes that you have and the sources that you're working with, all that stuff can get really, really complicated really, really quick. We're going to start back in three, two, one. Hold up. No, I'm playing. <laughs> gonna do it. Welcome back, everybody. Oh, man. So for those of you who don't know, who don't watch the chill cast, I have this thing where I just drop in and I just return back to the episode or I drop the episode unexpected to the entire chill cast. Rob always catches on. Chips almost never. No, Chips catches on sometimes, but we always catch Josh or Nick when I do this. Yep. So every cool. time. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, 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 perfect. But um, before we get into the more serious questions, I just wanna um, I wanna ask. I try to ask a few people this when they come on the show. I said a chill cast. Beast for <laughs> breakfast. Right. I run too many shows right now. Beast for know. breakfast. Um. What are some of your go-to games when the work day is over? Like you take off the work hat for the day, even content creation, you're done just being a content creator for the day and you just want some downtime to play some video games. What are some of those games you like to play? That, that's a great question. Like, so generally speaking, I always feel guilty playing games, even just to relax. And that's one of the pitfalls of being a gaming YouTuber. It's like, anytime you have a chance to play a game, it's always in your mind, like, why am I not mining this for content? Why am I not capturing this footage? So I've had to designate specific games that are like, it, it doesn't matter if you capture this, you can if you want, but you don't have to. Um, and I would say it really comes down to a few, a, a few different choices. One are um, chill games, right? Chill games uh, being games, I would say, that are, that are you know more of just like, I don't want to call them mindless, but games like like creative type games, like Dragon Quest Builders 2, Minecraft, even though Dragon Quest Builders 2 has a really long story. Mm -hmm. um, any kind of sandboxy type game where I can just kind of go relax, you know, it's very low pressure, I'm, you know, just, you know, building things or having fun or just listening. Because, I mean, Minecraft has a phenomenal soundtrack. I throw that on all the time when I'm working because it's just, it's so subdued and it's so just sublime, really. Can, can we can we talk about that soundtrack for a second? Yes, absolutely. Um, do you Did you get it for the Switch? Yeah, yeah, I have Minecraft on all platforms, and which is pointless now because it's all it's all connected. So. I um first of all, I'm thinking about going back to playing Minecraft because um I I got introduced um one of one of my friends she introduced me to this game called Mini World, which is like a it's a, it's a mobile game. Okay, and it's very minecraft like but there's a more a little bit more things you can do what i'm seeing that you can do in that game mm -hmm. but it's definitely minecraft inspired and right. 
when I was playing Minecraft on the Switch, game like the Super Mario, the Super Mario soundtrack, Super Mario sixty four soundtrack is on there. It's like oh, nice. And actually, we're gonna take a we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna detour a little bit. Sure. Cause I want to talk about that soundtrack, and I want to talk about Minecraft soundtrack. The Minecraft soundtrack, the Asian soundtrack they have, where um, the Asian soundtrack and just the peaceful soundtrack, like just the it's it's so easy just to zone out and play right that game it like it really puts you at peace and mm -hmm. while we're talking about this i'm thinking about wanting to play minecraft when we get off here later I'm, yeah i'm really considering it now but um i wanted to actually talk about one specific soundtrack and that is super mario 64. oh okay and how I like where this is going <laughs> and how underrated that soundtrack is oh, and yeah. how um I thank my cousin for this because me and him were talking about this yesterday. But they don't they don't make Mario music like that no more. Not not really. There there are no real modern Mario tracks. I would I would say there's just not really a lot of modern Nintendo platformer type track like Donkey Kong Country. Like I can go back to Aquatic Ambiance anytime. I can go. I don't know if it's just water levels, but like even Dire Dire Docks in in Mario 64 is incredible. That was that was what I was going to mention. Um, I'll tell you what, though, weirdly enough, another chill track, just, I'll, I'll detour this even further. I will put on a 10 hour mix of the Resident Evil 2 save room music and just let that loop. I find that to be so relaxing, which is weird because that's not a relaxing game. It's an incredibly stressful game for, for those brief moments you can, you know, find safety near a typewriter. Uh, it's pretty magical. But I think you're right. Like, I, there aren't a lot of modern games that really grip me with their music, uh, with some notable exceptions. Like, Persona, the Persona series has incredible music and I love listening to it, but that's not really. That's well, like RPG. There's some R chill track. Persona 5 is a pretty jazzy sound. Persona 5, I listen. Okay. I'm going to announce something to a lot of people that people don't know about me. I can listen to Persona 5 soundtrack all day. My favorite, my favorite song on that entire soundtrack is something that I don't hear a lot of people mention is their favorite, but this is my favorite, and that's Sunset Bridge. Like, okay. Sunset Bridge has like an hour long uh, YouTube extended. I could listen to that whole hour straight through. Run right. it back, listen to it straight through again. Run it back and listen to it straight through again. It's to right. me, it's like the perfect study and zone out music. If, I, if I'm reading a right. book, I would play that in the background, and it, it helps. For me, it helps me study and it helps me focus. Um, a lot of low fidelity, or as for those of you who know, it's lo fi music. It's the reason why that music is so good for studying is because the way the instruments, the tone, the tonality of the instruments and mm -hmm. even how the drums are made, they're made to go at a steady rhythm to help generate the human mind to focus more. Now that I didn't, I didn't realize. I'll tell you this though, like, I actually look up a lot of lo-fi on Spotify mm -hmm. to listen to while I'm working for or expressly that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I found is it seems like a lot of the lo-fi tracks I just sort of stumble across almost always will sample certain sound sound effects from video games. Like I'll hear exactly. like Yoshi in a lot of them, Mario sound effects in a lot of them. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, oh, there's something else I was gonna say about Mario 64 and I can't remember what it was now. It'll, you, it'll it'll come back to me. You go ahead. We'll we'll we'll, we'll dive into that. We'll we'll, yeah. come, we'll we'll come back into that. But the reason why and we kind of went way left field, but this is fun. This is just the fun part of of, right. the, of the of the um show. When it comes to lo-fi music, most lo-fi music have the same BPM. Mm -hmm. Well, beats per minute for those of you who don't know BPM, beats per minute or the same tempo rather, and it's usually around seventy it's usually at a specific rhythm so like like i said your mind i hate to use the term like this because it, i don't want to freak people out but it's almost like a form of hypnosis right. and it's like it trains your mind to focus more it trains your mind to be able to relax mm -hmm. and focus on the goals at hand which is could be really useful if you're somebody who doesn't want to be who wants who doesn't want to fall into distractions that's right. why a lot of people that's why they have you look on youtube they have study playlists about uh, of this um other music people have they have the same music that we heard in minecraft you'll hear music like that loop for hours right why because that type of music that type of sound that type of tempo and that type of feel that it gives it gives you a relaxing feeling and when the human mind is relaxed you are more prone to be more successful in the things that you're doing because a relaxed mind is a focused mind 
Right. And, and you know what? To me, that makes a lot of sense that, that, that they would use music of that type in a lot of video games. Because b- by nature of the medium, it's music you're going to hear a lot. If you're playing a hard game and you hear the same music looping over and over, if it's bad music, like it's going to grate on you pretty quickly. I think it's also one of the reasons that it's so hard to nail humor in video games. Because if you know a, a, a you know a cutesy cartoon character makes a funny noise once, yeah, okay, it's kind of funny the first time. If you have to listen to it a thousand times, where you just keep dying to the same boss over and over, it it, it starts to get uh, a little a little less a uh, little less comedic, I think. Um, are, you t- are you talking about Cuphead? No, no, I think Cuphead, Cuphead's masterful. I'm not referring oh, okay. to Cuphead. Well, Cuphead can be rage-inducing, but Cuphead's primary strength in preventing that, I think, is what a lot of ro- roguelikes do well, or, or games in a similar vein or that, that, that aspire to that level of difficulty. It's fine, as long as you can get back to the action fast. And Cuphead, as soon as you fail, you're just immediately like like one button press, and you're back into the action. You don't have to wait for a long loading screen or anything like that. Uh, I think I think that's one of the, the saving graces of a, of a, a game that can be so rage-inducing. Okay. So, Mar- going back to Mars the fuck, we went, we went, we we went down levels. We spur- we went from yeah, we went Minecraft from games to soundtracks to <laughs> we went from Minecraft to Mario sixty four to low five music. This is this is my type of conversation. But right. let's, let's pick it back up to Mario sixty four. Sure. What, we, what I was just discussing with my, with my cousin, kind of, it's like Mario sixty. And by the way, he will be. Um, on this on this show too so make sure you guys stay tuned for that because we'll be talking a lot about video games and music but from a different perspective you guys are not expecting um when it comes down to mario 64 those soundtracks were just so legendary it was you had the um the snow the slides the slide um, soundtrack then you had the bowser music and a lot of the music was smooth little dark it was a little bit of everything mm. compared to the mario music now which is probably why a lot of the mario games don't really sell to me that much there's more of a bouncy aspect to it it's more of a okay is more i'll say is more catered towards kids music and right. kids music these days it's it's things that will make kids jumpy things that make yeah. kids high, like height and you got to think about it with the power of that type of music being played for kids. Right. So it's funny, you, you know, when you play the Mario 64 music, a lot of the music is just easy for you to relax to. Even the the first level um, music. Yeah. The first level music is su- super jazzy. Mm-hmm. And it's like you're not really jumping around, but it's easy to relax to playing that whole entire soundtrack. Right. Bring it back to Minecraft. Minecraft is is just a game you can literally get lost in, especially if you're playing um, creative mode. Yeah. And you can have like a Sims aspect where you're building some of the best things that no one has ever seen before. Right. So. Yeah, it, it, I, I love it. I think Mar- it was funny like hearing you say just the names of the areas or specific moments, like instantly the music started playing in my head when you were like Bowser and I heard that you like, <laughs> that very foreboding but still chill enough you know music when it starts out when you're in that uh, one of those levels um iconic but, but it's weird like and I, I think that music stuck with me so much because i remember vividly because i was in about seventh grade i think when when i got mario 64 and i remember like i would just like sit at home where i would like talk to my friends on the phone while i played it and one of the things I loved about the, the just the game design period for Mario 64 was the area outside the castle. There's absolutely no threat there. You just have this 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 nice contained playground to get completely familiar with Mario and his mechanics and explore. Right? Mm-hmm. You can understand what a long jump is versus like you know, like like the backwards jump, and the triple jump, and kind of get familiar with everything. Um, but you're right. Like every single sound effect or even tiny musical interlude, like when you first jump through the painting, like that uh like like that that <laughs> sprinkle sound you hear. And then you hear like that, that that little cadence that plays right before the level kind of loads in and the, the screen fades from white. Um, yeah, like I I would listen to that music so much, probably accidentally, not even thinking about how much I'd listen to it on repeat. And it's just I don't know that, that'll never get old for me. You, you know that? Ba, 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 ba. Yes, yes, that. You know, it, it's like I thought I thought that was so creative on how they had voices do like the first interlude of the first Mario levels, right? Because the first Mario levels. Dun, 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 dun. It's yeah. like it's it, it was it was creative. That's why this is to this day my favorite Nintendo console. Probably 
it's right now it became more so the switch but most revolutionary in not just hardware but in software i still mm -hmm. say the n64 was the most, most revolutionary co nintendo console I, the, the thing that really blew me like the, the first time i fired up mario 64 and saw it with my own eyes that was one of my top five moments in gaming history was like my my brain just exploded going from 2d stuff to 3d stuff for the first time because i really hadn't spent much time with the playstation so that was really my first exposure to like full 3d graphics and seeing mario in that light and i love that nintendo still had that trademark playfulness right from the menu because you had this little hand that would pop up and then you could start pulling on mario's features and stretching his face out and stuff N absolutely didn't need to be there but that's just classic like nintendo playfulness on, on full display which i think is just wonderful it was it was but let's actually talk a little bit more about marketing a little bit and games these days they're not the same as they were back then i'm glad we would we, we got a chance to talk about this because now we're going to go fast forward to the future and we're going to sure. talk about indie games indie games have been more of a thing now and if you look at steam if you look at the consoles there's mm -hmm. indie games coming out literally every week right so i want your opinion on how these games are marketed on steam and even on the consoles are they marketed well or could they do better you know it, it, it's weird like in, indie games have been going through a renaissance i think since probably 2009 when we got braid uh, I, I would say that was like the first time we really saw like an indie game like just slam into like mainstream gaming discussion i think um and that was made by by one guy uh so when it comes to marketing it it's weird because you'd be tempted to say because it's a small outfit in most cases that would be difficult right now i think if we were talking about an indie game like mortal Kombat in 1990 what 1991 1992 you know that would have been a much harder position to be in because the first mortal Kombat was made by four guys right i think it was two coders yeah. a sound guy and a, and a graphics guy mm -hmm. but you know, today, with the power of the internet, I mean, if you make something that's good, I mean, you have a lot of avenues for, for marketing. Like, for starters, like, you could use Kickstarter to raise a bunch of capital from a lot of people who like the idea of your game. Uh, and then you could funnel some of that into marketing or ad buys on different platforms like Facebook. And you can get very nuanced with your targeting to make sure that you're getting that game, its, it's trailer or, or its value proposition in front of the right type of gamer, right? Because just because you make a game doesn't mean... If I, if I make... If you make Stardew Valley and you just throw it in front of a bunch of people who, who eat, sleep, and breathe doom, they're probably not your target audience. Um, but people who play Minecraft might be your target audience. And, you know, because or Animal of... Animal Crossing. Or, or Animal Crossing, exactly. So whenever I think about, you know, indie marketing, I would say it's... I'm trying to think of the best way I can explain this. I won't say it's easy. I will say it's easier than had they tried to make that same game 20 years ago. Like, there are a lot more avenues available to you. But the flip side of that is there's also a lot more competition, right? I mean, there are a lot of people out there who are making games now that didn't have that ability, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and in terms of how they get marketed, it's weird because they don't really have the money in a lot of cases to, to shell out to, you know, Nintendo or Sony or somebody to get, like, a featured spot on the store, right? I mean, there's a reason you didn't go to, you know, the PlayStation Marketplace and see Stardew Valley at the, at the, at the top of the list probably because, you know, you got to pay money for that kind of uh, that kind of spotlight, I think. Um, Ironically, but, though, that game, did, that game was on the top of the best sellers chart for a long time. I think it still is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't doubt. It's, it's an incredible game. Um but at the same time, like, I also feel like it, worse than just regular competition from other just, you know, people who are trying to make legitimately good games is shovelware still a problem. It was it was a problem, you know, during the Wii era. Basically, anytime there's a medium where there's a lot of money to be made, you're going to have people who are going to just just swarm into it. Marketing and business people and people who are just looking for a quick cash grab who want to get the maximum amount of profit for the minimal, you know, minimum amount of effort. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of really good games get sort of covered under this deluge of just like poor digital marketplace design or you know they just it, it's hard to stand out right i mean the competition is way more widespread than it used to be i definitely agree um previous episode i had uh the um the sound the the, the sound composer for um earth knight chipper mm -hmm. and Earth Knight is a fantastic game. Um, he did the entire soundtrack in chiptune, like chiptune music, which nice, which was incredibly creative. Like shout out to Chipper Crit on that because that that soundtrack, when you listen to it, even though it's chiptune music, you hear a lot of complexities 
in the in the songs themselves right and the one thing he said about game development that i always took away no game is ever finished at the time they first say they want to finish it yeah. every game has its delays that game took several years i think he, I think he said seven years to finish are games getting delayed these days yeah i guess <laughs> I guess you know, you know, just just little games like Final Fantasy VII Remake and of right, course, right, little, Dude, little games, Eternal. little games like Cyberpunk you know. twenty seventy seven. Right. No, not not majors. You know? Yeah, cutesy little indie titles. You know, yeah, pretty I much. <laughs> <laughs> but nah, um, he said like games always get delayed, and then it's like it brought a new perspective to me. That's why when I heard Final Fantasy VII Remake get delayed and these other games, I'm like, okay, the developers probably ran into something that they saw that they want it to come out towards their vision. And just from an artist standpoint, I I understood it. It's like as I matured in my in my craft, I've grown from the point of wanting to push it out so everyone can see it right away and enjoy it right away to let me make sure this is to my standards before I release it to the public. Right. And I think that's more what these companies are doing. And if they're doing that. I commend them square enix you know or any other um company that decides to do that right but um i wanted to get your last thoughts uh before we go to our commercial break i want to get your last thoughts on this other thing with marketing because we now know the ps5 has been revealed and we know series x has been revealed yeah both have been revealed specs have been revealed well somewhat specs for the ps5 mm -hmm. you know not full out specs but enough for us to know and I just want your opinion on how you know Sony and Microsoft are marketing these consoles. Did Microsoft release the Series X too early? Well, reveal the Series X too early, and is Sony making a mistake by not going to E3? Uh, okay. So here's my thought on the current. Well, I guess what we'll call the the next generation of consoles that are coming down the pike and what we have to look forward to. Um, in terms of how they're positioned for marketing, I think Microsoft is smart to get an early lead on talk about the specs now because i think they've showed just teases of what the console looks like now right it looks like a mini fridge and that's awesome it looks like a creepy little obelisk i like that yeah uh and you know they they've boasted about the power it's going to have but what they haven't revealed are some of the more key aspects right what are we going to get at launch what uh you know what's the pricing going to be for this beast of machine that you're pitching us uh and i think that's smart that they haven't done that yet because they're, they're learning from the mistakes they made in 2013 because sony ate their lunch in 2013 microsoft had so yeah. many missteps like like it, it was just like a comedy of errors first off they came out of the gate trying to launch a hundred dollars higher than the place they, they want to come in at 499 with their connect bundle and what was kind of salt in the wounds for gamers was they were very much pushing like oh this is going to be the center of your living room experience none of us wanted that we wanted something to play awesome games nobody wanted to make microsoft the center of our entertainment experience and the problem with connect was it was a neat idea but it needed to work 100 percent of the time for it to get an effective foothold and it worked like 70 or 80 percent of the time when it worked it was great but it needed to work consistently well and then on top of that they try to introduce drm which is a horrible horrible plan for a bunch of people who already are kind of well i will say this like technically speaking uh, game sales have flipped, right? Ten years ago, around 2009-2010, 80% of game sales were uh, were physical, 20% digital. Now it's it's almost completely the opposite. 80% digital purchases, 20% physical. They think that's going to drop to about 7% by 2021. So Microsoft came out of the gate in 2013, and not only did Sony capitalize on it, they just started picking the bones of it of its you know just poor rotting corpse in this, this just marketing landmine they stepped on. They were on Jimmy Fallon, they were on late night TV shows making fun of the Xbox. Like, look, you can't share games on the Xbox, but here I'll let you borrow this PlayStation game. Just making them just a, a huge laughing stock, and. That's because Sony was smart. They bided their time. They waited for Microsoft, uh, who, you know, is is a worthy opponent, right? They've got resources. They've got experience in, like, enterprise computing that gives them a leg up. Uh, and they let them basically just, just walk right into a trap, right? They, honestly, if if they had come in, Sony probably would have been delighted to launch the PS4 at $4.99, but I think they saw a huge opportunity to undercut Microsoft, and they took it. Now, what I think Microsoft's trying to do right now is they're trying to go to Sony. I think that they're, like like trying to freak sony out by being like look we're getting an early place you know we're, we're getting uh, a share of early marketplace attention right now people are understanding the xbox series x is a thing they know when it's going to launch they have some idea of the games are going to be put now like you know like hellblade 2 or you know halo infinite 
Uh, and I think what they're trying to do is get Sony to over to overstep and th them reveal their pricing. So Microsoft can try to do the same thing to them. And I don't think Sony's going to budge. Now, as far as their E3 presence goes, uh, e there's still going to be PlayStation games featured at E3. They're not going to have a stage presence, but I think there's still going to be uh, a fair amount of like third party you know, PlayStation stuff that we're going to see on offer. But Ubisoft, Square Enix, definitely. Right, right. Heavy hitters, heavy hitting, just like third party developers and publishers that have always been sort of key to that platform success. Uh, I don't think it's going to kill them, but I also think, unless it's part of a larger strategy that I just don't understand, you know, they they probably have some very smart eggheads thinking this thing through. Uh, I used to write off E3 and say, bah, you know, they don't need E3 anymore, you know, companies, like, look at Nintendo, they do Nintendo Direct, they're direct to consumer, why do they need to waste, you know, development resources making a demo to, to please a bunch of, you know, nerds at E3? And then I was one of those nerds who went to E3, and I was like, this is tremendous, everyone should be here. Totally <laughs> changed my tune. <laughs> and, like... And the thing is, like, the one thing that I think E3 is very valuable for that I totally didn't think about at the time is word of mouth marketing is worth many millions of dollars, right? You can't it buy is. that kind of marketing. It's more personal, right? If, if, if uh, you know, some dude on, on I'm trying to, like, if somebody from IGN tells me, this is a great game and you need to buy it, I'll take that into consideration. But if Avedon tells me, dude, you have to get this game, I will lend so much more weight to an endorsement from you than some you know, faceless corporate entity. And they proof know of this. There's proof of this. Uh, when I said I got DBZ Kakarot and I was going to play this, during the chill cast, this man was on route to Walmart. <laughs> on route to Walmart. Right. <laughs> so he is not lying, but... When you was talking about Xbox, man, I'm not going to lie, the whole time I was thinking Skynet. Skynet. <laughs> really? Skynet. <laughs> the original the Xbox One, Skynet. It was a little creepy. <laughs> That's all I can think about, Skynet. I mean, but I, I, have an, um, I have an unpopular opinion, though, about that. Sure. I felt like if they would have stick to their guns, they would have been way more successful this generation. How do you mean, stuck to their guns? In if what way? they did not reverse all the things that they said that people didn't like, if they just stuck to their guns and focused on the people who did like those changes, then because uh, look, if you look at how gaming is now, mm -hmm. and you look at how gaming, how what um they was originally planning things, how much far are they from their original plan? So essentially, what you're saying is you think they should have stuck with their original strategy and just it just gone all in on it, and you exactly. think that would have helped them win out in this generation? I it would they would have did better, probably not win, but they probably would have did a lot better. When you can't, when you can't show that you you are confident in your own decisions as a company, especially right. back then, you lose the trust of your consumer. Yeah, but I mean, their consumers were already getting pretty vocal about that being a myth. Like, did you did you really see, look to your Xbox to be your multimedia center? Did you want that? I didn't have an Xbox back then. But I'm like, okay, but okay. back uh, then, I get, I get, it, did, I get it. So wait, wait, you wait, wait. So you say you didn't have an Xbox back then? Did you have the choice between an Xbox on PS4 and you went PS4? Uh, let's uh, let's say this. Let's say this. I didn't get a PS4 until I met you guys, and I chose between a PS4 and an Xbox. Okay. And I chose me, and that was mainly because of why did you it, choose that? I'm curious. Hmm? I'm curious why you chose the PS4. I definitely want to hear this. Believe it or not, um, I like the games like um, I like the games like Monster Hunter World, and um, what was the other game I got? Dragon Ball Fighters. Oh yeah, yeah. But the game that I said I had to get on this, it was two games. Okay. I knew, I knew that would come up to come to PS4. Spider Man. Oh yeah. You know what the other game yep. is right. God of War. It's coming out in April. Uh oh, Final Fantasy Seven. Yes. Like, at first, I was like, "Wait, is he talking about Ghost of Tsushima? That, like, where are we going with this?" That was the game. Those were the games that made me choose between the PlayStation and the Xbox. It okay. wasn't a matter of hardware or anything, because at the end of the day, if we're really honest with ourselves, people were turning their uh, PlayStations and Xbox into multimedia centers anyway. I remember in college that people would literally have their own music playing behind Grand Theft Auto with their Xbox. Right. Right. Like the Xbox community was always doing that. People would play their own music soundtracks as they were playing Grand Theft Auto while they was playing the game. Yeah. Um, if you look at PlayStation, now I was I was this guy, 
when I had the original PlayStation 1, even PlayStation 2, I would play my burnt CDs and put them in the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2 and yeah. listen to my my music there as I'm cleaning up the house. Right, right, right. So I feel I feel as though turning it into a giant multimedia center you if people will pay for that service if if it's good enough here's what i'll say the multimedia center thing might have been fine as an as a as you know just a, a value added right i think what really would have done them and why i don't agree that they should have stuck to their guns is this DRM. if they the drm because if you go to drm like and your competitor is not doing DRM, like you shoot yourself in the foot because, like, yeah, they're not making as much money on pre owned sales, but for a lot of people, like, they only buy pre owned games. And if you're the platform where you can't trade games in and you can't recycle your stuff to get new games with the other platform, will let you, like, I mean, that's huge. Like, if you've got millions of people that rely on it, like, if they it, both done it, it would have been fine. It's a, it's a risk, it's a risky thing, but if they were successful in doing it, I feel like Microsoft could have created a standard. A standard in different in different in their own right and they could have had more of a stamp to say this is how we do things the fact that they changed their marketing approach mm -hmm. they came off as sony jr i, I mean like I, I i can concede that it shows a, a weakness but i guess from a pure consumer standpoint tell me it like when you say like this is how we do things and they're they kind of set the same is that the standard you really wanted do you want to see this DRM future come to fruition any sooner than it has to? Me, me personally, no. But that's me speaking from a personal standpoint. That's right. me speaking from the lens of a consumer. Right. As a business, I would say, if this is what we believe in, mm -hmm. let's go forward. Let's go forward with it. And it's like the way, because you, you have to think about, there's a few things. I forgot dude's name. Oh, my goodness. Dude's name. If I feel, if I felt like anyone dug the hole for Xbox, for Microsoft, he's he he got fired. Obviously, you talking about Jay Allard, the the one that said, "Well, we have something for something who who do who people who don't have an Xbox One and want to play their old games. We have the Xbox 360." Uh, I don't, no, that wouldn't have been Jay Allard. Then Jay Allard was like he was like the 360 era. Yeah, not Phil Schiller. It was a guy like he basically was encouraging people to buy Xbox 360s instead of the Xbox One to play certain games. Yeesh. Yeah, probably That's, not the message you want to send with a new product launch. That to me, that was what dug the hole for the Xbox One. Yeah, you know, I will say, like a company that has been good about sticking to their guns, though, by by forcing change. And you know who I'm about to say is Dang Apple. It. They were like, "We're gonna get rid of the headphone jack," and it's weird because like everyone like crucified them. They're like, "I can't believe they got rid of the headphone jack." But then like competitors like LG and Google did the same thing. They also started removing the headphone you know, jack after Apple did it. I believe Samsung did it too, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. Um, and then Apple was the first to be like, you know what? We're sorry. Um, you know, Flash has had a good run, but we're not going to let it run on iOS. Sorry. No Flash. Now, quick question. I have to, I have to ask you. Uh, I know Rob will be bigger up on this, but um, are you familiar with the new phones that are coming out this year? Uh, from Apple? Not just Apple, just like from Samsung as well. Uh, not entirely. Like, I don't really stay up on phones unless it's an, it's an Apple product. I, I know that's what I'm going to be locked into. Although I will say that that, uh, I, I like the idea of folding phones. I think that's a very cool idea. I don't the, know if it's ready yet. But. The folding phones looks cool, but the Galaxy S11, it's almost making me not regret, but make me wish I waited a little bit longer to get a new phone. Oh, really? Because the Galaxy S11 has like, it's, I, think, I think it's a 44 or 120 megapixel phone. Oh well, and I'm all, I'm always curious about camera technology more than anything in phones. That's why I'm. A, that's that's what because me I I for those of you who don't know um, I I like doing random photography. So I'll take things of birds. I'll take pictures of the, the moon, the sun. I'll take random pictures like that. Things that you go to see you would want to go see in in a outside somewhere. And it's and that's just not and that's not me boosting myself up that's literally what someone said to me at my job today it's like you know yourself belongs on the canvas so you can see this at you know in museums and stuff i don't think that highly about my work about my, my, my about my photography because i don't hone the craft enough for me to hold up an opinion of it i just like taking pictures right but, um enough rambling on that we're gonna go ahead and go to our next commercial break and we'll be back shortly for the last part of this interview stay tuned
have little to no viewers whatsoever, there's also a lot less pressure, right? Because even though you may not be getting the engagement that you want, it's also way less stressful when you don't have to really keep conversation going because nobody's really talking, you can focus on the game and it's just a little bit easier to chill out. Now, personally, I think it's a really good idea to get in the habit of talking to yourself even when nobody's watching, which I've talked about on a previous video, but nonetheless, not everybody is comfortable engaging in conversation when people start showing up to a stream or you might be struggling with how to keep, you know, people engaged, talking, enjoying the stream and to make sure the conversation comes easy. And depending on how naturally sociable or charismatic you are, this might be a breeze or it might come off as completely daunting. But just know that if you're somebody who deals with this, it's not at all uncommon and a lot of people have this trouble just in regular day-to-day -day life, let alone when they're streaming and putting them out there to a potential audience of millions of people who could bomb in at any second. So today I thought I would go over a few of the ways that I personally keep conversation flowing in my own live streams as tips that you can also use to keep conversation flowing in yours. For starters, make sure that you're greeting new people as they arrive to your stream. This is an easy way to fill some of the dead space in your conversation, plus it gives you a chance to earnestly show somebody how much you appreciate them taking their most precious resource of all, time, and choosing to spend it with you on your channel while you stream video games and just hang out with friends who are, you know, willing to check out what you're doing on YouTube. And for most people, it absolutely makes their day when they just get acknowledged in some way. So that's an easy way to not only start the engagement, but also make sure that other people who are watching feel that they're valued whenever they're taking the time out of the day to watch you do what you do. Because everybody, both offline and online, likes to feel acknowledged, so that's an easy way to... Welcome back. Hope you guys enjoyed that commercial break. I hope you are enjoying some of your Player 2's content as well. If you have not already, please make sure you go over to his channel and subscribe. If you are someone who is trying to grow as a, as a YouTuber, it doesn't have to be gaming, but his content is not only for gaming. Even though it's gaming related, trust me, you, his content can help you. It's helped a lot of people. But we're going to talk about gaming in, a, in another way. We kind of dipped into it a little bit in the, um, before the break. And we started talking about gaming music and gaming soundtracks. Um, we talked about the Mario 64 soundtrack. But what are some other soundtracks that really stuck with you in your childhood? I'll say for me, and I say this almost every podcast these days, is Sonic 3. Sonic 3 soundtrack always stuck with me. But what about you, man? Oh, I, I'm so glad you... Like, I... I, I I don't want to say a sickening amount, but a large amount of what I listen to on Spotify is mostly video game soundtracks. But the ones that stick out the most to me from childhood, and I'm going to cheat, and, and I'm going to go into, like... Can, can I go with a high school go ahead. one as well? Okay. Go ahead. It's early on, the soundtracks that definitely stuck with me, uh, F-Zero was incredible. That was super fun to listen to. Nice. Uh, um, moving forward a little bit, I think, Donkey Kong Country, again, was was a classic that I... I, I you know, I couldn't get up. Weirdly, is a, there's a game that wasn't even console. I don't, oh, it was actually. It, it came to the PlayStation at one point, but what had a really good soundtrack was a, an old Westwood game called Command and Conquer, which was a real time strategy game. I used to play with my dad all the time. It was such a fun game. Nice. Um, other good soundtracks that I listen to. Moving forward, I mean, I always go back to Silent Hill soundtracks because. Okay. They are hauntingly melodic. Uh, Akira Yamoka does incredible work, um, which, sadly, Konami has run that series into the ground, so I don't know uh, the next time I'll get a good one. But quick follow-up to that that I'll say, uh, Daniel Lick, the same guy who did the the music for the, the show Dexter, did the soundtrack for, I think it was Silent Hill, I can never remember if it's like Book of Secrets or Book of Shadows, I always get the name wrong, but it was the really crappy Vita game that came out. Uh, and it was a really good soundtrack, because I was very, you know, kind of hesitant, because I was like, Akira Yamoka does, does Silent Hill, you don't get to do this, Daniel, but then I was like, man, it was really good. Uh, I think he also did the Silent Hill Downpour soundtrack, but yeah, childhood music would, would definitely be like, like F-Zero, it's hard not to remember, like, su a lot of Super Mario World tunes, those are amazing. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else during my formative years that I really like. I mean, Street Fighter. Street Fighter 2, I spent so I much time just playing. just about to ask about It's Street hard Fighter. to leave that out. Like, Guile's theme was great. I, I mean, most dun, of them. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I would say Street Fighter, for me, growing up, has definitely been a staple. Yeah. Um, a lot of RPG music, really, was a lot, was for me growing up. Um... Of course, the Final Fantasy VII soundtrack is always iconic to me. Uh, there's still music to this day that I would go back and listen to right. from that soundtrack that I always uh, felt that was amazing. Um, Anxious Heart uh, was from Final Fantasy VII and also um, Judgment Day and also the bombing mission. There's, there's just so many different songs on Final Fantasy VII that I like because you know what? I'm gonna I'm, we're gonna go go down here. I feel like Final Fantasy VII's uh, soundtrack mm. it really brought a tone 
to serious RPGs because yeah. many RPGs that came to America that were on a Super NES, they were all E-rated games. And even though those soundtracks are really good, and you know you heard it on the 16-bit era, hearing these tracks in 32-bit and hearing like the symphony uh, that used to um, make some of these soundtracks, and hearing some of the orchestras made it make some of these soundtracks, it was crazy. Like uh, One Wing Angel, you had uh, Sephiroth's regular theme. You mm-hmm. had um, there was just there was just a lot. Even the Overworld theme, the first Overworld theme, and then how as time goes on, the Overworld theme changes. It's there's just so much to that game that the the soundtrack. I feel like it inspired other composers to step their game up for their RPGs. Right. And looking at um, even Street Fighter, Street Fighter soundtrack, I'm going to say this. No disrespect to Mortal Kombat. I, I, I give respect to Mortal Kombat. I give respect to Samurai Showdown. I give respect to Killer Instinct. I oh, give, yeah. I give respect to... Um, Killer Cuts. I forgot about that. What, what, what was that? What was that game? Um, Primal Rage. I give respect oh, yeah. to Primal Rage. I give respect to all the classic fighting games, Fatal Fury. Mm. All of them get, get get my respect. But Street Fighter had the most iconic fighting game soundtrack of all time. Why? Because almost everyone remembers. I'm going to start naming off different characters and their themes are going to go off in your head. Colonel Guile, Ryu, <laughs> right? Ken, Sagat, yep. Bison, Balrog. Yep. It's like even Dalzium, Dal, like seven characters easy. Right. It's like you could remember their soundtracks in 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 their head, even Blancas. Mm-hmm. And when I looked at when I looked at Street Fighter, it's looking at game, looking looking at um Bison's. Bison's was to me was the most iconic boss music, like last boss fighting game music of all time, like the right. original Super Super Street Fighter. And when you're when it's like his when his music sped up, it, it put I felt like it put the most pressure on you to to make sure you do good. And I feel like that's why I lost against Bison so many times because when his music speeds up, it's almost like he's fighting at two thousand percent at that point. Right. So I guess going back to the gaming soundtracks, man, it's these iconic soundtracks. I guess where I'm where I'm getting at is. I feel like video games these days, they don't take the time and the effort to evoke that emotion anymore. I feel like the soundtracks are more placeholder than emotion evoking it. And the only soundtrack that I could say that's been recent that really evoked emotions for me was Xenoblade Chronicles 2 as a major game. Gotcha. I I remember you spoke favorably about that. As far as I'm probably limited in my ability. Well, yeah. I, I'm probably limited in my ability to speak to the musical offerings of modern games the way you are, since you are way more well versed in that than I am. Um, but I take, will say, take it away, take it away. There, there are a few modern titles that that have stuck with me. One of which, it, it sounds cliche, maybe it's just because f- it's fresh on because I've been playing it so much. Is Sea of Thieves is amazing, but I think it's more the sound design than the music itself. The shanties are incredible, and they've got a couple of haunting melodies that I feel like have perfectly defined the atmosphere of like that, you know, like swashbuckling sort of, of lifestyle or, or the experience they're trying to glean from that game. Um, other games that really kind of got to me, it, it was, a uh, what was it? I'm sorry, Gone Home, which a lot of people sort of deride as a walking simulator, but I thought it's, it's a game you can beat in about an hour and a half, two hours, right? But the thing I loved about it is it was set in the 90s, right? And uh, actually... Uh, before we get on this, I was I, I didn't know this was out. I'm a big Kevin Smith fan, and I started watching Jay and Silent Bob reboot because I had not seen it yet, sadly. Missed Kevin when he came to Columbus about six months ago. Um, but I always liked Kevin Smith's early stuff because like it was set in the 90s, right? So there's a lot like, like grunge and punk kind of, kind of music that's put into it. And the same thing was used uh, in Gone Home because Gone Home was set... Uh, in June of like 1993 or something like that, right? So when you explore this house, everything is like, you find SNES cartridges that look like they have Street Fighter on them. You find diary entries from this girl who talks about her playing Street Fighter 2 at the arcade with her friend Sam. Mm. Uh, and like the whole house, like there's tube TVs everywhere. I mean, it looks like you just walked into a house from 
1993. They did a great job with the visual design. But then also all of the music, uh, one, it's a very chill, like just the regular backdrop music, which is sort of like mine, Minecrafting, I guess you would say. Uh, a little somber in tone. But then you also sort of find... Um, CDs or or music from your 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 little sister in her room that you play in a place like like punk music like that. So I thought that was really cool and just establishing like an atmosphere, I guess, that made you feel like you were in a different period. All right, cool. So um, the last thing I want to ask you, and it's not really gaming music related, but it's just more mm-hmm. fun question because I just want to throw something fun out there to you. What are some of your favorite gaming arcade memories? Oh my god! There's like it, 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 this is weird. Like I feel like I, I love the book Ready Player One. Right? I didn't like the movie quite as much, but if you have the the, the opportunity to listen to the audiobook version, which is narrated by Will Wheaton, it's tremendously well done. Um, I feel like I was born in that era where I was just at the tail end. Like I was just barely too young to really have like the dedicated arcade experience. Right? When I was growing up in high school, there really weren't a ton of kids who were like, "Yeah, let's go to the arcade." And there wasn't one in my town, but there was an arcade at the mall across the across the river from my hometown. And like, and I have a few notable arcade experiences I can think of. One is, uh, I don't know if, if it was like this where you grew up, but in my where I grew up in a small town, there was a Pizza Hut, and that Pizza Hut, I was, I felt so blessed because it not only had uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game, but also the X Men arcade game, both of them. Uh, and those are just That's staples. Like, best. you talk to anybody in our age group, like, hey, what were some of your favorite arcades? You best. know, at least one of those is going to come up. Uh, they also had a game that really freaked me out called Time Killers, where you could cut someone's head off right at the beginning of the match, and yes. it was horrifying, but I was like, this is so cool. Um, so that was like my earliest, probably like six, seven years old. Like, I always wanted to go to pizza. Their pizza wasn't particularly good. They had better pizza where I grew up, but I want to go to pizza so I could play those machines. Um, and then when it came to going to the mall arcade, I remember two distinct memories. One is I had uh, my, uh, a friend of my parents, um, or I guess it was like a friend of the family. He was like, hey... Uh, I'm really a big fan of Terminator. They got this new Terminator machine. Do you want to come help me beat it? And I was like, yeah. And I just watched him pump like two twenties into a, a quarter machine and get like forty dollars worth of quarters. Like we're gonna beat this game no matter what. And playing the T2 arcade machine, which was oh my phenomenal. goodness, I remember that. It was so with good the, with the big with the big machine gun. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yes. And then you have to fight like the HKs like flying at the screen. And like you had like that. Uh, oh, it was it was some kind of. Uh, it was like in the future where it was like yeah that Terminator on treads is the first yep. boss. It would like scoot back and forth like this. Um, and then I vividly remember also, uh, a little bit later when I was probably closer in high school, um, I couldn't quite drive. I was probably like 14, 15 years old. And my mom, I remember she would drop me and my friends, the twins off the mall and they had an arcade there and we would go there and we would play, uh, house of the dead like crazy. And when the Dreamcast came out and they released house of the dead for that and light guns, yeah, it like over. it was over. Like I was so excited. And that, that was a huge turning point. Cause at that point you realized, Ooh, Arcades are getting really, really irrelevant right now because all the best looking arcades can now be brought home with, you know. Speaking of that, there's one game I feel like they should bring over to the Switch. What's that? And they should allow you to play this with your friends online. It's one of the most iconic arcade games of all time. It's not It's not X-Men. I wonder if I could guess it. It's not Teenage Mutant Mut- 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 Ninja Turtles. Okay, is it... Is it- is it older arcade or newer arcade? Newer being like Turtles and Ford or behind Turtles? Like mm. like late 80s? I would say early 90s. Early 90s, okay. It's I'm, easily one of the best, it's easy one of the most appreciated, I'm going to say the best, but easy one of the most appreciated arcade games of all time. Is it a Mortal Kombat? Nope. Is it, it's not Killer Instinct? Nope. It's not a fighting game. I'll it's not a fighting game. But it's an iconic. Was it a was it a was it a light gun game? Was it a what? Was it a light gun game like Area Fifty One or? I feel like it's gonna be so. I feel like I'm gonna be so mad when you say. What yeah, this you is. are. All right, well, all right, what is it? Simpsons Arcade. Oh my god! Yes. <laughs> so okay, like one more thing. Like so, where I live, there was a place called Spare Time, and it was like a combination of like roller rink and laser tag type place. It was two blocks away from my house, and we would go over there, and they had the Simpsons Arcade because that was a six player game, if I if I recall yep. correctly. It was. And uh, and they had that set up, and it was right next to the roller rink part of the thing. And I remember playing it. Ooh, that bugs me. I I, I was thinking of, like race. I was like maybe he's just talking about like cruising Exotica or something, but nope. no. Nope, that's why I said early '90s. It's a much older game, right? But um, for me, one of my one of my favorite arcade stories, for, for of course playing Simpsons Arcade, but one of them was um back when movie theaters had good ar- arcades. Um, uh-huh. I went to a mall called um, Kings Plaza in Brooklyn, and um, 
Like, I went to a movie with a few friends and we went to go see. I forgot what we went to go see. All I know is they had one arcade there. Yeah. And it was, um, it was Tekken. It was, I forgot, I forgot yeah. which Tekken it was, though. Yep. But my my boy like he was facing it he would he would he he just wanted to play Tekken so right he was playing against the computer for a few rounds and someone just out of nowhere they even let him finish his fight put his coin in and started started wanting to play right so my boy faced him and lost I go against him and I happen to see him once this is how I knew I like fighting games yeah but I happen to see him two rounded him like they didn't even to go to round three nice and that's nice. one of the things I always loved about, you know, I'm not really good on joy joysticks area with arcade, but when I don't know what it is about fighting games, I adapt well. So Right. I I'll say this. If I ever, 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 ever have enough money where I have a good man cave basement, I'm gonna make sure I have a good arcade collection of games. Nice. So we're going to go ahead and close on out of here, but I want to just pose to you one more question. Sure. What is some advice that you can give um, rising content creators? Right. So when you say rising, you mean somebody who's like, like starting to get a little bit of traction, not somebody uh, who's like starting fresh, starting fresh, starting for do both, starting fresh it, and getting traction. Uh, man, I feel like there's a whole lot I could say here, but I, I'll, I'll say yeah, this go, to start. Go ahead. Go ahead. Make, let, let make, a, make a bunch of weird stuff. Don't worry so much about what other people think. Don't worry about how perfect your end result is. Just make bad stuff and do it over and over and over again and find out what you like and make sure you actually love the process of doing it. Because if you don't love the process of doing it, it's not going to be sustainable long term anyways and you should spend your time on something you truly love to do. Uh, the second thing that I would say is if you know that you love it and you're making good progress, uh, don't be afraid to be patient. You know, I know there's, uh, and we live in a world of constant news stories and social media updates about these, you know, like, like, you know, kids who hit it overnight with a viral sensation of video and everything. And it kind of creates this, this, this false sort of reality where it's like, oh, you start to think, oh, that's the norm of how people get to where they're going in, you know, the online arenas. 90% of the time, that's, a, that's not at all how they get there. Like those are the exceptions, not the rule. So go easy on yourself future you will thank you for it you know make just try to make great stuff uh and do it at a ca at a pace that's not going to like drive you crazy or anything like that and just you know stay true to yourself make stuff that you enjoy making um and you know just be realistic about about getting to where you want to go right i'm not saying don't be ambitious i'm not saying don't work hard i'm saying you know if you're tempted to get down on yourself or stop entirely because you're not where you thought you'd be when you got started just ignore that voice in your head. You, you don't have to sweat it. I'll say pace yourself. To add on to what Josh said, make sure you pace yourself and make sure you take self-care days. Make sure you give right. yourself permission just to take the day off. And you don't have to answer anyone. If you need to take the day off, you need to take the day off. Yep. So, Agreed. With that, thank you guys so much for coming through. We really appreciate it. If you like this episode, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. And most of all, most of all, you make sure you share this with a friend. This is Avadon, and you're player two, and we are out. Peace.